Hi, this is John Linnebal, and this is AP U.S. History Video 25, The Development of the Constitution. And if you like this video, please don't forget to comment, like, share, and subscribe. And why not check out my site at testpreparation.locals.com, where they won't show you any ads. Developing a Constitutional Framework Framing the Constitution, delegates to the 1787 Philadelphia Constitutional Convention agreed the Articles of Confederation had to be completely replaced. It took four months of debate and writing to reach the compromises that would become the Constitution. The Great Compromise, also known as the Connecticut Compromise. The delegates to the Constitutional Convention agreed a powerful central government was needed, but there was great controversy over several important issues. One obvious issue was how would states be represented in the government? Populist states, that is ones with more population, didn't want one vote per state. They wanted the number of votes that they had to be proportionate to their population. Less populous states obviously wanted one vote per state. So in today's terms, think California or New York versus Montana or New Hampshire. California would want the, to have a number of votes relevant or to its number of uh, people living in the state. So it'd be definitely something that it relates to California being the most populous state or New York being the fourth most populous state versus Montana or New Hampshire states that don't have that many people would say, oh, no, 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 let's have one vote for state because then New Hampshire would be just as influential as California. Large states favored the Virginia plan. So here we see the Virginia state symbol and which would be a bicameral legislature with the number of representatives from each state tied to population. And let's move on. The smaller states countered with the New Jersey plan. And in case you're wondering, this is the New Jersey state seal. And ooh, we went the wrong way here. Okay. So in the unicamera, which would be a unicameral <laughs> Wow, having trouble with that. Smaller states countered with the New Jersey plan, a unicameral one-house legislature with one vote per state. Basically, the Articles of Confederation plan just being continued. After a great deal of debate, the delegates reached the Great Compromise, also known as the Connecticut Compromise, which led to the structure of the present-day Congress. And here is Connecticut's state seal. So... The plan was that the House of Representatives would have the number of representatives based on the population of each state, and that continues to this day. That's why California has the most representatives and whatever the least populous state is has the least representatives, Rhode Island or New Hampshire or something like that. And in the Senate, each state gets two senators, which is exactly what we have today. Some interesting artifacts, things that have resulted from that. Political parties and other groups often concentrate on Senate campaigns in less popular, not less popular, less populous, with less population, um, such as Montana, New Hampshire, Idaho, Wyoming, because they have two senators just like California or New York. But if you want to influence the senatorial election in Montana, you can buy time in a much smaller television or radio market <clears throat> and pay a lot less money and your cause can then elect a senator from a state doesn't have to be from you know just has to be from a state doesn't have to be from any particular state so if you can in quotes buy yourself a senator from montana that's going to be a lot cheaper than in quotes buying a senator from california or new york so of course i'm being a little facetious but you know if you want to get a principled senator who supports your very worthy cause it's easier to do that in montana than it is to do it in california let's say okay Three branches of government, the Constitution, Article I, Congress. The Constitution created three branches of government. That is the legislative, the judicial, and the executive. The Constitution sets out the powers of each branch. Article I states what Congress can do. That is regulate trade, interstate and foreign. The Commerce Clause would later be used to expand federal power greatly. You know, the power to regulate the states would be based on the federal power to regulate interstate commerce. So they could say, okay, we can regulate anything that affects interstate commerce, which is practically anything. You know, it runs a post office, declare war, approve treaties, and impose or levy taxes. 
These are all really, really important things. If you can't impose taxes or levy taxes, you can't fund your government. Post office should be pretty obvious. Declare war should be pretty obvious. Approve treaties, well, that's probably how you end wars, is by approving treaties, etc., how you prevent wars. So those are all important things. The Congress also had the general power to pass laws that were necessary and proper and to provide for the general welfare of the new nation. The powers of Congress were thus rather elastic. They can't really go overboard. Normally, if you see a law that's just, oh, well, it's necessary and proper to provide for the general welfare, a lot of times that's a little too vague, so that might get stricken down by the Supreme Court, etc., as something that's outside of Congress's power. But generally, as long as you can link that to something that Congress is authorized to do, and then you can say, eh, well, it's, you know, for the general welfare, and, well, why are we doing it? Because it's necessary and proper. It will probably work as long as you can link it to an enumerated power, such as running the post office, declaring war, approving treaties, regulating commerce, etc., so, the powers of Congress were thus rather elastic. There was obviously a great debate and still is over what is necessary and proper for the U.S. public and also what is the general welfare and what supports the general welfare of the new nation or this not-so-new nation anymore. And here's Frank Zappa's opinion. Every major industrialized nation has a beer. You can't be a real country unless you have a beer and an airline. It helps if you have some kind of a football team or some nuclear weapons, but at the very least you need a beer. So that's Frank's opinion on what a country should have to be a real country. Anyway, little humor there. Article 2 of the Constitution, Executive the President. Article 2 of the Constitution allows the President to suggest legislation to command the armed forces, he's the Commander-in-Chief, and to nominate judges as well as many other appointed officials. The President is the CEO, the Chief Executive Officer of the U.S. <clears throat> so if you want to remember that he's the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, remember his plane is Air Force One, so... Technically, I guess that's the number one plane in the Air Force because it carries the commander-in-chief around. The president is responsible for enforcing laws passed by Congress and enforcing federal judgments, mostly through the Department of Justice, through its subdivision, the Marshal Service. So here you can see an Air Marshal's badge. Here you can see the seal of the Department of Justice, United States Marshal. You think of all the old Western movies, you know, the federal marshal would be sent out there. And they have them today, go to a federal building, the guys who are running the metal detectors and things like that are also federal marshals. And they can enforce federal judgments, they can go and levy money from your bank account and things like that if you have a judgment against you in a federal court. Article 3 of the Constitution, the judiciary. This is the federal court system. Article 3 of the Constitution sets out powers and responsibilities of the federal courts. Article 3, Section 2 states in relevant part, I edited, I edited it for length and clarity. Edited. That's kind of a hard word to say, huh? Anyway, the judicial power shall extend to all cases arising under this Constitution, the laws of the United States, and treaties made or which shall be made under their authority, to all cases affecting ambassadors, all cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction, to controversies in which the United States shall be a party, to controversies between two or more states, between a state and citizens of another state, between citizens of different states, between citizens of the same state claiming lands under grants of different states, and between a state or citizens thereof and foreign states, citizens or subjects. So we're talking about anything that affects ambassadors or anybody who's kind of a federal official, talking about treaties which were made by the United States, anything that happened under federal law or the Constitution, all cases of admiralty or maritime, well, that's shipping, sea, fishing. So those are things that happen on the high seas. Might not be easy to figure out what state's court should do it. So fine, that's going to fall under federal law. And you have one state suing another state. Obviously, you can't hear it in the courts of either one of those states without the other state saying, wait a minute, you're just using your courts. Of course, you're going to rule in your favor. That's no good. And then a state and citizens of another state, same idea. Citizens of different states, same idea. And lands under grants of different states, basically the same idea where you would have 
a controversy between two states over whose court should decide the matter, that's going to be a problem. In cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, and those in which a state shall be a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. So the U.S. Supreme Court, if one state is suing somebody, the Supreme Court can actually hear the trial rather than just hearing the appeal, which is normally what the Supreme Court does, or something involving ambassadors, public ministers, the Supreme Court actually hears it. All the other cases mentioned, so the ones mentioned up here, the Supreme Court has appellate jurisdiction, so then that would have to go from federal district court to whatever circuit it's in. For example, in California, it would be the Ninth Circuit, and then only from the Ninth Circuit if you appealed from there, would it go to the Supreme Court? And the Supreme Court also, it's discretionary, meaning the Supreme Court can deny the right to have it heard. It's called denying certiorari. Certiorari is where they order a certified copy of the transcript. That rarely happens. The Supreme Court usually says, nah, we're, we're good with whatever the appellate court did. We're fine with that. Uh, the Circuit Court of Appeals, we're good. Anyway. So, shall have appellate ju jurisdiction, both as to law and fact, with such exceptions and under such regulations as the Congress shall make. So, Congress can make some sections as to what the Supreme Court is supposed to hear, etc., and when it's supposed to hear it. The trial of all crimes, except in cases of impeachment, shall be by jury, and such trial shall be held in the state where the said crimes shall have been committed, but not when committed within any state. The trial shall be at such places, place or places as the Congress by law have directed. So again, this is something, if it happened on the high seas or some way happened between states, in these days of telecommunications, it could be, well, if I committed internet fraud and I'm in California, but the people who I defrauded were in Texas or something like that, well, where's it going to be heard? Something like that. So notice this is everything that just doesn't neatly fall under one state's jurisdiction. So the federal system picks that up. And here's a link to the full text of Article 3 and interpretations of each section. ConstitutionCenter.org, Interactive Constitution, Article, Article 3. Definitely suggest you look at it if you want to learn about the Constitution. Checks and balances, separation of powers. The framers of the Constitution were obviously very wary of powerful central government, so the legislature, judiciary, and executive branches were supposed to keep each other in line. Thus the phrase checks and balances. Each branch was has a way to overrule the other two. The president can veto laws passed by Congress, so we can see here. And the president can do a veto. Congress can send of something for the president to sign. He can veto it. Congress can then shoot back by overriding vetoes with a two-thirds vote. Notice Congress can also impeach the president. So as it says here, Congress can pass laws limiting presidential power and can override vetoes. Congress also confirms judicial appointments. That means they have to approve the judge, so that's approved federal judges here. Um, I know when I first heard of confirming appointments, I was in fifth grade, I was like, does that like a secretary where they call up and say, okay, you have an appointment for three o'clock Thursday, you know, we'll see you then. No, that's not secretarial work. That's basically, you don't become a federal judge unless Congress says you get to be a federal judge. So the judicial branch, has power over Congress, it can declare laws to be unconstitutional. So the Supreme Court can rule a law or executive action is unconstitutional. So you can see here, can declare laws unconstitutional or presidential acts unconstitutional. For example, if Congress passes a law saying that police officers all over the United States are allowed to inspect anybody's packages that they see them carrying on the street for no reason other than that, they're packages. Uh, because it's an anti-terrorism law and we know that explosives and weapons can be carried in packages. Well, the Fourth Amendment says you can't do that without a warrant and some other exceptions, but you can't just randomly stop people and inspect them in general. So that would be a law that would be declared unconstitutional by the courts. If the president, through executive order, ordered the same thing saying, 
Uh, okay, every federal law enforcement officer is hereby authorized and, in fact, ordered to stop anyone that they think looks suspicious or just anyone that they see carrying a package that's big enough to carry a bomb um, to stop them and inspect it. Right then and there, again, the Supreme Court or the federal appellate courts would say, eh, no, you can't do that. Or even a federal district court would say, eh, no, you can't just stop everybody. There's a thing called the Fourth Amendment. So, you know, Fourth Amendment doesn't have any meaning if you can just stop people to have them inspected for weapons or drugs or things without any suspicion that that person actually has them. All right, let's move on. Judicial appointments can be controversial. So here is Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, and this is Anita Hill. Anita Hill is someone who had worked under Clarence Thomas when he was at the U.S. Department of Education, and later when he became the head of the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which investigates sexual harassment claims of other things. She said that he sexually harassed her and made some comments that were not very nice about people who were in adult films and some other things. You can look this up if you want and go to the Clarence Thomas Supreme Court nomination Wikipedia page. And all of these allegations were heard in confirmation hearings before the U.S. Senate. So if the U.S. Senate had decided that was a game, game killer, showstopper, whatever, Clarence Thomas would not be on the Supreme Court, but he was voted in by a majority of the Senate. And a more recent example, here we have Brett Kavanaugh, who is currently on the Supreme Court with Judge Thomas. He, is, he was accused of sexual assault by at least two women, including Christine Blasey Ford, who is a college professor and mental health professional, and basically you know, accused him of some very bad sexual behavior back when they were both much younger. And you might remember seeing on TV or on the news or on the internet, I like beer! I still like beer! That was his testimony before Congress as part of his confirmation hearing. So he had to address these allegations before the Senate. Again, the Senate decided to confirm his appointment, so he is now on the Supreme Court. And you can look this up online. It's pretty easy to find. Checks and Balances separation of powers. Congress can impeach the president. The chief justice of the Supreme Court presides over the trial and the Senate is the jury. So the common misconception is that impeachment means that the president is kicked out of office. It does not. It's just a criminal indictment. So basically it's analogous to if someone is arrested and the district attorney brings charges, that's an indictment and impeachment is an indictment so that just means that in this case Congress is acting as the DA here and so for the president to be kicked out he has to be found guilty at a trial before the Senate so the Senate acts as the jury they you know, and the person running the trial is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court Bill Clinton was impeached but not found guilty so was President Andrew Johnson after the Civil War and, of course, our recently departed president, Donald Trump, was impeached once early in his term and has just been impeached again. In case you're wondering why he's been impeached, again, now that he's no longer in office, it's because if he's impeached, they can take away his pension, they can take away his travel allowance. There are all sorts of things that former presidents get as a perk of their job that... If he's impeached and found guilty, then they don't have to give him. And it's also a symbolic gesture just to show, okay, this person was bad, so we don't want him as an official ex-president. We want him to be a disgraced ex-president. The president can pardon federal crimes and commute sentences. This is another presidential power. The president has the power to pardon people accused or convicted of federal crimes. Trump was Trump pardoned many people just before leaving office, which was, you know, a couple days before I recording. I'm, a couple days before right now, it's the 21st of January 2021 as I'm recording this, so Trump left office yesterday. He pardoned many people on his way out of office and commuted the sentences of others, including former Detroit Mayor 
<laughs> have a little space there, so it's mayor, sorry, former Detroit mayor Kwame Kilpatrick. So when you commute someone's sentence, it's not the same as being pardoned. If you're pardoned, it's as though it never happened. Um, if your sentence is commuted, that means they can take you out of prison, or instead of being executed, you get life in prison. You know, it's some way that they lighten your sentence for whatever you committed. So, Donald Trump cuts Kwame Malik Kilpatrick's jail time for Detroit corruption by 20 years. He's the former mayor of Detroit, got himself in some trouble over some pretty major corruption there, got caught through a whole lot of text messages, but Trump decided to commute his sentence. Pardon me. Okay, people did ask whether Trump was going to try to pardon himself. Most constitutional law experts say a president can't pardon himself, which is actually just common sense, because if you're the president and you can pardon yourself, then you can do whatever you want and then pardon yourself for it and then do whatever you want again and pardon yourself. So then you have unlimited power because no matter what you do, it doesn't matter if it's a crime because you can just pardon yourself for it. So no, presidents can't pardon themselves. And... Here's an old joke about Ford and Nixon. Gerald Ford pardoned Nixon for Watergate. So the old joke is Nixon bumps into Ford. Nixon says, oh, pardon me. Ford says, I already did. Ha 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 ha. Anyway, the president can't pardon himself. That's the way it is. And James Madison on the Constitution. So the basic structural elements of the Constitution, the three branches, checks and balances, are found in James Madison's Federalist Number 51. You can find this at the Federalist Number 51, 6 February 1788, at archives.gov. Here's the link right here. I'm putting my little pointer over it so you can see the URL. I'll put that in the description below as well. Anyway, aren't you glad you live in a time when these documents are available for free on demand from your computer? When I was your age, you know, you, either you had a set of encyclopedias in your house or you were screwed if you weren't able to get to the library. So it's really, really awesome that today you can look all these things up online for free because people just want you to be able to educate yourself. And here we have federalism, how state and national government relations work. So the basic idea is under a federation, you have a national government, states, and ideally there's a balance. Federalism is the relationship between the state and federal governments. The Constitution gave federal government much more power than the Articles of Confederation gave Congress. The states retained certain reserve powers, but the federal government was given enumerated powers, including the power to tax, declare war, regulate trade, and provide for the general welfare. Madison proposed that Congress be given the power to strike down state laws, but that proposal was rejected, at least partially anyway. The supremacy clause of the Constitution dictates that the federal government is the supreme law of the land, and many state laws have been stricken down by federal courts as inconsistent with federal laws. This is often called federal preemption. That's kind of a huge legal issue, is did Congress intend to preempt everything in that entire field so any state laws on that subject are invalid or just on this one subject and it's just going to be preempted based on that or is it something where no it's fine state laws and federal laws can both exist or at least these ones don't conflict with each other so there's no need for preemption etc hide from that 70s show on the three branches of government you might remember that 70s show from the 1990s if you don't here it is, Hyde's explaining, the three true branches of the government are military, corporate, and Hollywood. Little 70s paranoia for you there. Anyway, pretty funny joke. Did you find this video useful? Please like it and subscribe to my channel. Neither action costs you anything. You'll be alerted about my new videos. Why do I care? It's simple. YouTube doesn't let me share any ad revenue unless I have 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 hours. That's 240,000 minutes of view time in a year. While many people are watching these, I don't have 4,000 hours of watch time. I also don't have 1,000 subscribers at this time. Want to see this without ads? Try joining my community at testpreparation.locals.com. For the same reasons, you are not only welcome, but encouraged to share links to this video, put it in playlists, etc. I'm always happy to read and respond to constructive criticism or suggestions for new videos.
I reserve the right to delete comments from and block those who specialize destructive criticism, you know, trolls or people who like to post things that are off topic, you know, spammers, disturb people. You can hire me for tutoring. I can tutor you in person, subject to stay at home, shelter in place, COVID laws um, in the San Francisco Bay Area, or you can hire me for tutoring online anytime through Zoom or whatever video conferencing service you want to use. Thanks for watching. If you want to see how to contact me and another little thing I want to tell you about, stay tuned. Contact me, Facebook, Instagram, email, phone. Facebook, you just go to facebook.com forward slash Linabal Tutoring. Instagram, instagram.com forward slash John dot Linabal dot tutoring. And phone, 415-623-4251. Email john at johnlinabal.com. And website, go to www.johnlinabal.com or johnlinabaltutoring.com, testpreparation.locals.com, and John Tutoring, 1859 Powell Street, number 109, San Francisco, California, 94133. This video is based on Barron's AP United States History Review Book and any other sources I've listed in the video description and my general knowledge of U.S. history. While this should help you do well on your AP U.S. History exam, I can't be responsible for what your teacher thinks is important and asks you about in his or her own tests, homework, etc. Please read your class text and pay attention to what your teacher says in class. All right, with that, hope you're having a good day. Talk to you later.